Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, assalatu wa salam wa ala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm about Okay, um, so we're trying something out new. I'm trying something new out, however you want to say it. So going through a little technical difficulty. Sorry for being late, y'all. But what we're doing now is we're using a different service just to see how it works that um, we are streaming on Facebook live at the same time as streaming on YouTube. Um, so this is a free service and it gives us a little bit more capabilities. And, um, so this is what we're just trying out. Inshallah, we might be going forward with this, um, when we take over, our, do our other shows as well, inshallah. Um, Amr, if you're with me, I want to try something out real quick. I want to see if I could, uh, turn, if I could add you to the stream. Are you there? Or available? I want to see how it looks with your camera on. I'll wait till he responds. Maybe he's not listening, but there may be a delay also. But um, again, <clears throat> okay. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa everybody. Welcome to joining Cult Conversations. Are you there? Okay. Um, let's, so let's try this. All right, so I'm going to add you to the stream. Okay, I can hear you. My quality is a little bad. I'm going to have to turn. Let me see. Okay. Now, could you turn your camera on a little bit just to see how it looks? If you don't mind. Okay, let me see. How do I how do I turn your camera on? Can you turn yours on? Edit name, remove guest. Huh. So it doesn't it doesn't Amr, can you say anything? Oh, I can barely hear you. Um is there any options for you to turn your camera on? Maybe if I stop sharing. Yeah, and I can barely hear you too. Oh, there you go. I wonder what's going on with the sound because I can barely hear you. Hmm. There we go. Oh, there we go. Now I can hear you. All right, cool. MashaAllah. Okay, so, and we could change different screen layouts. So if I share. Uh, gives us the option to uh, change the screen layout. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, a little, a little bit more options. And if, if anybody's, I've tested it. So like the comments on YouTube are not, the comments on YouTube and Facebook would all stream directly into this chat. So if I, I'm going to. I got you. And then, but I, th I think I just found out when I typed into the chat, it only goes to YouTube and it doesn't go to Facebook for some reason. So let me see. Sir. Cause it says, uh, can't post messages to some channels. It says learn more. Okay. So you might we... at that, but like I upgraded probably. Yeah. It says you could post the pages, but you can't post a purse cause I got it. I'm like bootlegging it. I created like a fake facebook personal page to stream it to okay um but if we if we paid for the upgraded version on um, the 15 dollars version we'd be able to comment on the page postings and we would be able to go live on twitch youtube facebook linkedin but i don't know if we need like those pretty much facebook I'll and youtube though. should be enough yeah yeah i don't think we're gonna use switch yeah oh, we could, though. <laughs> let me see if there's any other things we could no, that's good enough. All right, so I'm gonna start with the talk. All right, Shukran Amr. I see you. If I could kick you out. Yep, kicked him out. There we go. <laughs> All right, alhamdulillah. Okay, so let's go split screen like this. Okay, inshallah. All right. All right, assalamu alaikum. We're continuing our talk on Islamic leadership. 
Um, we have this Sunday and next Sunday will be our last times. And then we will continue with our normal cult conversations with specific cult content. Um, we will, I will not be on that weekend of the Eid, which is the weekend of, let's see, it will be Sunday, um, the 23rd. I will be out of town traveling for the Eid, inshallah. So we will not have a, a discussion that weekend. We'll be enjoying uh, enjoying the, the Eid with our family, inshallah. So we're going to continue our talk on Islamic leadership. And again, the main point to learn about Islamic leadership is so that we can understand and identify the difference between good leadership, bad leadership, cult leaders, and so on and so forth. Um, let's see. Nope, not coming down to VA. We're going to San Diego. <laughs> Come down to VA for the next Eid, inshallah, when we have the R2F event. Um, so let me just like, let's see if I could uh, slideshow, play from current side. Oh, well, that does too much. All right. So we got the slides here. Maybe I should make my face smaller. Yeah, let's do that. You guys don't need to see my ugly mug. Change it. Ha ha. Wait. There we go. Okay. Can we zoom in on that? I wonder. Oh, interesting. Okay. I don't think you guys can see that. So maybe make that bigger. There we go. That'll. No, nope, you guys still. Still looks a little weird. Well, let me stop sharing and share again. Sorry for the difficulties, guys. But we're gonna we're gonna get through this. Don't worry. Entire screen. So let's do that. But I don't want to see it on that screen. Play settings. Nope. So yeah, entire screen. That's a little better. Okay. All right. So. Dun, 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 dun. Where did that go? There we go. Nope. That's not it. Okay, here we go. We're getting there, guys. All right, so no, to, so to, today we're going to talk about some other qualities and characteristics of Islamic leaders given through, of course, the perfect example of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this, this, these qualities, though, really pertain to how they deal with the people and their relationships with people. Okay, so one of the qualities of a good leader, an Islamic leader, is that they're they're visionary, okay? Um, and visionary means that they have a clear vision of what the goals are, what they're trying to achieve with themselves and with the people that are following them, okay? And if we look at the example of Rasulullah and Allah telling us through Rasulullah what our goals are, what the vision is. Why are we Muslim? Why are we created? Why are we here? Why should we follow Rasulullah Sallam? And of course, we have the ayat in the Holy Quran where Allah says, and I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me. So it's very clear. That's the purpose. That's the goal. That's the vision, right? That's it. And also in the Holy Quran, uh, Allah says, so he who is drawn away from the fire and admitted to paradise has attained success. So that, that's the definition of success. So it's very clear that our the purpose that we're here is to worship Allah. And our goal, success in this situation, is making it to paradise and not being thrown into hellfire. Okay? And Rasulullah said, when you ask from Allah, ask, ask for Firdaus. 
genital fertiles, the highest paradise. That's what we're supposed to ask. That's our ultimate goal is to make it the genital fertiles, right? That's the ultimate goal. So the vision is very clear. Okay. It's clear, it's concise, and it's straightforward. And when you have a clear, concise vision, it inspires people. Okay. Now, people that are bad leaders are able to inspire peer, inspire people. But what they do is they manipulate people's own um, desires and they use those to inspire people. And you'll see that within their vision, there's no clear vision, right? You'll see like in cult, cult leaders that you ask every other different person, they will tell you a different vision or a different purpose of the cult. They'll say, oh, we're in the cult because, you know, we want to get closer to Allah. Or we're in the cult because we're going to take over the world and there's going to be jihad. Or we're in the cult because we want to educate people. Or we're in the cult, whatever, they'll give. They'll all give different reasons of what the purpose of the group is. And you'll see that all the different initiatives, they don't align with anything. They'll put resources here, put resources there, but nothing really aligns to one common, straightforward, clear goal. Okay? Except when you actually look at it in the context of a cult and you see that the clear goal is to actually boost the status, the income, the power of the actual cult leaders, right? When you actually look at it in that framework, it's like, oh, wait, everything that we've been doing for the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, right, has been solely to boost or help or aid or empower the actual cult leader, right? Where, especially as Muslims, we're, we're, it should be very clear what the goal is. The goal should align with what our, our goals are in Islam, which is to worship Allah and make it to paradise. Okay. Not only do they inspire you and tell you what the clear goal is, they actually provide a practical example of how to achieve that goal. And we all know this in Prophet Muhammad says something. We have all the hadiths that we're supposed to say showing the practical way to achieve that success. We have the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha who said that the character or the behavior or the actions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was actually the Holy Quran. That he was like a walking, talking Holy Quran, right? So they actually do, they actually practice what they preach. They actually show you how to get to success. Whereas you look at cult leaders, they tell you a lot of things, but they actually don't practice what they tell you. They'll say eat less, sleep less, drink less but then they're overweight. They'll say, oh, don't be about this world, right? Don't be into material things, but then they have all types of material possessions like Rolexes and um, you know, um, expensive cars and these types of things. They'll say, oh, build yourself a small one or bedroom house, right? Meanwhile, they live in mansions and have multiple houses, okay? And one of the things that they do too, and we talked about this, some of the qualities before of, good Islamic leaders is that even though there's a common goal, a very clear vision, they know how to address people individually, right? Individually to what they need of how to achieve that goal, right? So for for instance, if Rasulullah SAW didn't deal with each Sahaba exactly the same, he deal with he dealt with them personally and individually. So much so that each Sahaba, if you were to, not each Sahaba, but a lot of Sahabas, they would actually think that Rasulullah SAW loved them the most, right? So we have Amr bin As, and it's the, the hadith comes from Amr bin As in which we find the, the status in, of, of the different Sahabas, okay? And he asked him, he thought, he, he thought he was so for sure that Rasulullah SAW loved him the most that he actually went and asked him. He's like, Rasul Sallam, who do you love the most? And Rasul Sallam started listing people and basically got to the point like he never said Amr bin As's name. And so he's like, okay, I'm not going to ask anymore <laughs> because he really thought that Rasul Sallam loved him more than Abu Bakr, more than Aisha, more than Khadija, more than Uthman, more than Umar, more than Ali. He thought he like, but that was the personal relationship he had with them. But you'll see in cult leaders, they paint everybody with the same brush unless they're trying to manipulate people. Let me see. So the next thing is, is that good Muslim leaders, they're transformational, right? They're transformational. Trans, they call it transformative leadership, 
okay, transformative leadership. And transformative leadership is pretty much where you're actually causing a positive change within the people that are actually following you, okay? Where you actually see a change. People are bettering because they're following the advice, the teachings, the lessons, and the example of their leader. They're actually becoming better people, okay? So in the Holy Quran, Allah says, certainly did Allah confer great favor upon the believers when he sent among them a messenger from among themselves, reciting to them his verses and purifying them and teaching them the book and wisdom, although they had been before and manifest error. So in this ayah, it shows that before Rasulullah came, these people were ignorant. They were in total wrong. They were to in total error. Then Rasulullah came, brought them the Holy Quran, brought them the Hadith, brought them his Sunnah, and they became the best people um, that have ever existed, right? So if you look at that, look at that same example of in cults and with cult leaders, how has the cult leader actually transformed the people that he's followed, that followed him? And we're not talking about one or two people that may have been like had up, you know, bad lives. And then, you know, at the end they had good lives. We're talking about the, the majority of the people that follow him because the majority of the people that followed Rasul became better people, right? Talking about thousands and thousands of people that were from, went from ignorance to being the, the most blessed generation. Where, whereas in cults, you'll see that there's multiple generations that have been following the cult leader and they're in the same predicament, if not worse, than they were before they actually started following the cult leader. And you'll see that in almost every single cult. And they will they will take superficial advances, superficial um, like improvements as it was actually the responsibility or it was actually due to following the cult leader. Like for instance, um, in general, most most families, if they're doing okay, are going to progress, right? And then there's just regular progressions in society, right? People are getting cell phones, people are getting higher technology, people are all these different things. They will associate that natural progression with, oh, it's because I followed the, the cult leader. But it's like, well, wait a minute. Compare yourself to people who did not follow the cult leader. Are is your life better off? Are you a better person? Are you a better family? Are you a better community? than the communities that didn't follow the cult leader? And the answer is always no, always no. So we have some other examples here, and this is how you transform people. There has to be a system of rewards and punishment, which we all know in Islam, there's rewards and punishment. Um, they have to inspire people and follow through with promises. Right, that's a big thing. So if a cult leader comes and says, I promise you, if you follow me, you're gonna, you know, be rich or you're gonna have better lives they actually follow through with these promises where you see that's not the case in in, in cult systems and like in the, a good example of this of how rasul sallam transformed people within their own lifetimes you have saraka bin malik and for anybody that knows his name or is reminded of his name he is the sahaba that before he became muslim when abu Bakr and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were, you know, making hijra, and they went and they were hiding in the mountains and all these different things. Remember, there was a tracker that kind of found him, right? They found them and they approached him and they were talking and basically the, the tracker said, I'm not going to report you, right? That was Saraka bin Malik. At that time, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, you will eventually wear the crown jewels of Kisra, right? The Persian emperor. And this is a Bedouin desert, you know, out in the desert. He's like, I'm going to wear the, the the crown jewels of the Persian emperor. And he's like, yes. That came true in Sirach bin Malik's life. It came true in his lifetime where um, during Khalifa Umar's reign, they actually conquered the Persian, you know, king, the Persian emperor. And has brought back the war booty, which contained the crown jewels of the Persian emperor. And Umar, to fulfill the promise of Rasul Sallam, put them on Saraka bin Malik. Okay? So that's he fulfilled the promise. He transformed people within their lifetimes. Whereas 
like for instance, in these these cult leaders will say, will they'll tell people to motivate them, inspire them. Oh, you're going to take over this country. You're going to lead the army of so and so people. And you'll see these people have come, gone, passed away. Some are in their the twilight of their life, and these promises have not come true. This is when this is a sure sign of a liar. Next, we have servant, servant leadership. And this, and we, we should all know this because leaders, we say it all the time, leaders are servants of the people. Leaders are servants of the people that follow them. Where you see that the leaders are not the servants and the people that's following them are the servants, then that's when you're going to have a cult leader or someone that's manipulating a situation and taking, taking advantage of the people that's following them. So we have the ayat in the Quran where Allah says, there has certainly come to you, O messenger, from among yourselves. Oh, there has certainly come to you a messenger from among yourselves. Grievous to him is what you suffer. Grievous to him is what you suffer. He is concerned over you and to the believers is kind and merciful. Like, look at how many leadership qualities are just in that one ayat. That he, grievous, like basically saying, when you got, when his followers, when the people that are following him, still some suffer, it hurts him. It hurt him to see his followers suffering. And, he, and Allah says that he is concerned over you and he is kind and merciful to you. And you have the other ayat where Allah says that the leaders, they prefer others over their own selves, despite themselves being in need. So look at in these cults and you look at, okay, how much has the leaders of the cult suffered for their people? And you'll, you won't find any examples, but you will find plenty of examples of the followers of the cult suffering for their leaders, suffering for generations for the leaders, why their leaders enrich themselves, empower themselves, and don't give anything back to the own communities that made them rich, right? You don't see, like, and we look at the example of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would go into debt. He would go into debt. Hey, buddy. <laughs> he would go into debt to help people. He would go to, into debt to, like, help feed people. He would go into debt to help others. How many people do that? How many people go into debt to help people that are in need? How many times has your cult leader or your sheikh or your imam or imama or whatever, how many times have they actually went into debt, gone broke? When you go into debt, that means you're broke. For, for Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that means he had no money to give. He had nothing left from himself to give, so he would borrow money from somebody else to help to give somebody else. And then he would find a way to pay back that debt for, for himself. Meanwhile, you have these cult leaders that have millions and millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars, but they won't build schools. They won't upgrade their properties. They won't help the poor people of their communities, but they will start a fundraiser. Well, I'll start a fundraiser. Why is there a fundraiser when you have millions of dollars? We have the Hadith that, um, and that ayat right there, the, the, the one that's 59.9, they prefer others over their own selves, despite them themselves being in need. It, there's a ayat that there was a situation that happened that basically caused the revelation of this ayat. This bab, this babel nuzul. Okay, and this hadith is in. It's agreed upon. It's Sahihain. That means it's in Bukhari and Muslim. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you have heard different versions of this same hadith. So a man from the Ansar was hosting a guest. And he had nothing with him but with, but just enough food for himself and his children. So basically, imagine just imagine a situation. You have a guest come over to your house, and you literally have no food. You only have enough food that for one meal, and that's enough to feed yourself and, and your children, right? And or you're basically your family, your household. But yeah, a guest came. So the man said to his wife, put the children to sleep. And put out the lamp. So basically saying, put the kids to sleep and turn the lights off. Turn the lights down. And serve our guests with what we have. So basically they 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 made it dark so that the guests couldn't see that they weren't eating. 
They put the kids to bed so they wouldn't be crying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And they served the food to the guest. And they did it in such a way so that he wouldn't notice that they were doing this. This is an example of people that actually care for others more than themselves. Okay? But you won't see that. We, if, A lot of people, if you want to see good quality leadership, there's that series, the Umar series, that you should watch. Like a lot of these examples are, are in there. Right? Like we, we, we go to... Uh, speaking of Umar, we have the, the example of when he would go out to see who was hungry and he heard one of his followers, one of the people, the Uma, that was complaining about him because she didn't have enough food in her house, whatever. So what did he do? He went to his own house and took food out to give it to the lady. What else did he do? There was a time during Rasul, during Khalifa Umar radiallahu an. Um, rain, there was a drought, a severe drought. People were starving, people couldn't eat. So he went on an oath that he wasn't going to eat meat or good food until the drought was over. This is an example of Islamic leadership. And when we have Muslims claiming to be leaders, claiming to be holy and saints, and they're not doing these basic leadership things, then know that they're a fraud. Okay, we got a question. Wait, show? Oh, I can show the comment. Look at that. Uh, Islam Lincoln, what about competency? For example, using a member of the cult that is highly educated, even more educated than leaders, how should the educated person be treated Islamically? And how should they be treated in the cult? So there's, we, we I think we mentioned the hadith, um, the narration from... Aisha radiallahu anha, where she said, you treat people according to their status. So if, so are you saying that, for example, they're, they're the cult that is highly educated, even more educated in leaders, how should the educated person be treated Islamically and how would they be treated in the cult? Um, so I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, uh, Nadim. But we treat people according to their status. We treat people according to their level of understanding. So if the person is highly educated, then you can have a highly educated discussion with them about things. So um, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by like them using them. Like that, it, you will see that in cult systems where they're the leaders, because you don't have to be educated to be the cult leader. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. All you have to do is be the one that has the power. All you have to be is the one that people think that they have to stick to you in order to um, have a relationship with God, right? They think you're divine or something like that. So what they will do is they will use these people that have qualifications, education, whether it be Islamic or secular, to bolster their own status, right? They'll bolster their own status and they'll use these people because as long as, like for instance, if you have, well, here's a perfect example. You have people in a cult that say may have allegedly gone overseas to study at an Islamic university. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Maybe some did, maybe some didn't. But all the people in the cult believe that these are now educated Islamic scholars or students of knowledge. They, you know, call them scholars. So but it doesn't really matter what these scholars say because as long as the cult person is still in charge, the people look at these scholars, alleged scholars, or people that went and studied, these educated people, and it's like, well, if this person who's educated and um, you know went and studied, and if they're not saying anything, if they agree with all this, then everything must be okay because I'm ignorant. So that's another way that educated people are used in the cult. Okay. Um, Muslim leaders, when they're dealing with other people, they also take counsel. They use a shura. So that's what that's what shura means. Shura means counsel. You take counsel with people um, to get to get their opinions and and their insight because some people might know more than you. If you see a leader that's surrounded by what they call yes men, right? All they do is agree with what the leader says. The leader can, the cult leader can come up with any crazy idea, thought, initiative, and they're just like, yes, yes, G, 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 Abu G, G. Like that's their only response. 
No one's saying like, hey, wait a minute. Maybe you should consider X, Y, Z, or I don't agree with that decision. I think you should do X, Y, Z, and here's why. It doesn't mean that the leader always has to agree with them because a shura does not mean when you're taking counsel and you're doing a shura, it doesn't mean like it's a democratic vote, right? It just means that you're considered considering, you consider and take into account the qualified opinions of people around you. They give you counsel. They give you good counsel. They give you good advice. And you consider those things because a good leader recognizes that they're not always right. Okay. Um, in the Quran, Allah says, it is out of Allah's mercy that you, O Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, have been lenient with them. Had you been cruel or hard-hearted, they would have certainly abandoned you. So pardon them, ask Allah's forgiveness for them, and consult with them in conducting matters. Once you make a decision, put your trust in Allah. Surely Allah loved those who trust him. So look at look, look at those perfect ex, ex, uh, instructions of being a leader and how to seek counsel and how, from Allah, right in the Holy Quran, right? He says, consult with them and consult with them. That means take their advice. And then after you make a decision, trust in Allah, okay? So that's another quality of, of good Islamic leadership. The next one is that they're positive. They're, they're generally positive people. They're positive, right? They don't scare their followers with doom and gloom, gloom, right? They're not negative. They're not always talking about punishments and how bad people are and how their followers aren't nothing. They don't, they're not dismissive of their followers, just saying, you know, all the time, we don't need you. We only, I only need one person to follow me and whatever. That's, that's not the signs of a good Islamic leader. Rasul Sallallahu was not going around telling the Sahabas on a day-to-day -day basis, Allah doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. Even though they know that. Even though Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi did tell them that Allah does not need you. Even though it's in the Holy Quran, right? Rasul Sallallahu was positive. He had a positive outlook on things. And he, for the most part, fostered positivity within his followers. So if you look at the Hadith, that's in Bukhari and Muslim. Rasulullah sent Muadh to Yemen and he said, make things easy and do not make things difficult. Give glad tidings and do not repel people. Cooperate with each other and do not become divided. Look, look, look at that. Where's the negativity in that message? And Muadh, I believe, was, was a, a, a mirror of one of the provinces or one of the locations. And he's given advice how to be a leader. He's basically saying, take it easy on the people and don't make things difficult for them. And he says, give glad tidings. In other words, be positive, right? Be positive. Tell them about paradise. Tell them about how to be good. Tell them about, you know, all the things they can achieve if they, you know, follow through and be good people and good Muslims. Be positive, okay? So that's another aspect. If, if you see that people are controlling others with negativity, especially people that are claiming to be Muslim leaders, um, odds are that the one, they're just not a good good leader, or two, they're trying to manipulate you somehow. Because one of the things you have to do to keep people in cults is you have to keep them scared. You have to keep them scared. You have to, be, be, have, you have, to have them afraid to do anything, especially do anything on their own. You have to have them so scared that they're afraid to even think. They don't even want to think on their own. Right. That's what you have to do. You can't be positive and tell a cult, you know, if you're a cult leader would say, people, I want you to think. I want you to, you know, ask me questions. I want you to really be like if like if if these cult beliefs are really true, you would challenge people to think about them and contemplate them and ask questions about them and refute them so that you can solidify in their hearts. Like, no, this is the truth. Because this is what happened in Islam. Rasul Sam was questioned all the time. He was refuted all the time. And through these refutations, through these questionings, through Rasul Sam providing the correct answers, because it was the truth. He came with the truth. If people come at you with negativity or questions or they want answers, they want to challenge you, and if you have the truth, the truth will always prevail. And we see that in the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Um, let's see how many we got here left. Let's see. A few more. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna breeze through these a little bit. Um, so transactional, transactional leaders. Um, basically, if you ever heard of the carrot and the stick, where you can get a donkey to move by either holding a carrot in front of its face, that means it thinks it's gonna get a reward, or you could hit it with a stick and it's gonna move that way. Okay. So leaders, Islamic leaders know. Good Islamic leaders know how to use these two tools. Whether it's, you know, sometimes using a stick, not that much, or using a carrot. And we have the ayah in the Quran where Allah says, Oh, Prophet, indeed, we have sent you as a witness and a bringer of good tidings and a warner. So this is throughout the whole Quran, right? Where Allah gives us glad tidings of paradise, forgiveness, all the different things in Jannah, right? That's the carrot. That's the law holding a carrot out in front of our face saying this is the reward you're going to get if you keep going, keep going on the right path. Then we also have the warnings where law tells about hellfire, punishments, punishments in the grave. That's the stick. That's the law hitting us with the stick. Like this is the warning. This is, you know, be careful. So again, this also ties back to having clear goals and most importantly, holding people accountable holding people accountable not only holding people accountable but hold the leader holds themselves accountable you know we see all the times in in cult groups where people aren't held accountable right people are only held accountable on a a case-by-case basis depending on what their connection is with the cult leader one person that commits adultery is lashed they're you know they're beaten they're, they're locked up in a shed for 40 days and fed bread and water. Another person, you know, that's, you know, in good with the Khalifa or the leader or the cult leaders, family or whatever, you know, they get some private admonishment. You know, they're not exposed to the people like that. Other people, nothing happens to. They just say, oh, give us, give us, pay us a fine. Right. That's, that's an example of how, you know, cult leaders aren't accountable and they don't hold the people accountable. Um, and this is a big one, um, cultural awareness. You'll see that cult leaders, they don't have like a real cultural awareness and not cultural in a sense of like, there's different cultures and there's diversity, but like, you know, um, there's Africans and Asian, you no, know, that type of stuff that, that has a little bit to do with it. But the, the, the real Thing I'm talking about with cultural awareness is that they know that groups of people are different and they treat them accordingly. This ties back to the whole emotional intelligence, right? Not treating everybody the same, not painting everybody with the same brush. Good leaders can recognize that different groups act in different ways. Okay. And we have the Ayah the Quran where Allah says, be gracious and join what is right. Right. And the ayat with the word also transitions to do what is right according to the customs, do what is customary, and turn away from those who act ignorantly. So in the Quran, it tells Rasul and the Sahabas and all of us to basically be cognizant of what is culturally appropriate. Okay. And you have to understand it's important to understand the differences between people because you can tell, say one thing to one group of people and a little be translated differently by another group of people. And if anybody's had this kind of like cultural awareness type um, situation, uh, should know about how different cultures treat different things and how they behave differently. Like if you're, if you're leading a group of westernized African Americans, you can't treat them like um, Indo-Pakistanis, for instance. Right. You should recognize that they're culturally different than that the, the the one other group that maybe you're used to dealing with. Okay. And you should treat them accordingly. An example, of course, is you have Rasul Sallam who was dealing with the people in Mecca and also the people in Medina, which are two totally cultural, two cultural separate groups. Okay, and we and we have like incidents that you know I are revealed in the Quran where that deal with those cultural differences um you know just to give it give an example like 
the, the there's the one ayat where Allah revealed where it says, "Go unto your women, um, as you please." Pretty much. I don't have the ayat with me, but everybody should know this ayat. And the reason why this was revealed was because of the cultural differences with Meccans and Medinas. So Meccan people were used to having physical relations in a certain way, where Medina people had physical relations in a different way. And when they're intermarrying in these different things, then it was causing marital issues because they had different cultures. Okay, and we're supposed to have to deal with that on a day to day basis. Now, if you see that your leader, your cult leader or whatever, doesn't recognize or treat you just like how maybe where they came from or their culture or they force their culture down your throat and say, just become like me, not recognizing the differences of of the type of people, the, 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 the nations you live in, like even in America, people in the Northeast act different than people in the Southwest, right? And we can go all over, even people in the Northeast, there's there's people in like my own state, New York, people in upstate New York are culturally different than people in New York City, and it's in the same state. So a good Islamic leader recognizes those differences and acts accordingly. Okay. Adaptable. Um, a good Islamic leader is adaptable. Um, I don't know if, if I'm too old. Maybe some people don't know. This is Gumby. It's, it was like an old animation um, back when I was a kid. And Gumby can just basically, he he's like Play-Doh. He would just adjust his body to whatever he needed during the episode. That was his thing. So he was very adaptable. Um, we have a question. Let me put it on the screen. In cases where a leader has transgressed, who is responsible or in authority to bring them before a Qadi? Um, so, Islamically, um, anybody can bring a case against a leader. Anybody can. Anybody can bring the leader to, to a Qadi. Okay? Um, and that that's, that's the Qadi's job, actually, to bring them in to address the case. OK, this is why when you look at the, the great imams like Imam Abu Hanifa, they refused to be Qadis because during those times, the leaders were corrupt and the Qadis were pretty much in the pockets of the leaders. So they would only give rulings according to what the leader wanted. And they suffered prison time and stuff like this because they refused to be a pawns of the leader. So. The lowest person should be able to go to um, the highest person and say, you transgressed, you were on my lawn, I'm going to take you before the Qadi. And the Qadi has to hear that case. So the person who's responsible, one, the individual, the victim, the person that's been transgressed, has to bring their case before the Qadi. And the Qadi and those authorities have the responsibility for making sure that the person's case is heard and that there's justice. If they're not doing that, then that's a problem. That means the whole system is corrupt. Okay, so being adaptable. Um, <clears throat> and again, that goes back to the whole accountability thing, right? If there's, if there's no system in your community or your organization where anybody can be checked, then that's a problem, right? That's a problem. That's a sure sign of a, of a cult or at least just a, a, a bad leadership structure, okay? Because everybody should be able to um, be checked. Even in our own westernized system, right, we, we took – social studies in high school we know we have checks and balances we have the executive we have the judicial and the legislative and there's checks and balances in place if there's no checks and balances in place like in it and it doesn't even have to be in your organization i'll give you a good example so for there was a, a ex-cult member who wanted to bring the leaders up on charges so they went to the cult's cadi or their judge and said like i have charges to bring against your leaders and the cadi or judge basically said, 
I don't have to deal with you because you're not in the cult no more. No, that's not the job. Islamically, as, as a Qadi, there is a responsibility. Once you take that position, you are responsible and held accountable to Allah that you answer questions and cases from everything that comes to you. Right? Rasul, look at the example of Rasul Sallam. Non-Muslims used to come to him. Non-Muslims used to come to him and there'd be cases of non-Muslims versus Muslims. And Rasul Sallam would treat them accordingly. Deal with them justly. Right? But when you have the system that there's no cot, there's no checks and balances in place, that's just a cult setup. There's no accountability. Who can hold it? I should be able to go into a cult and say, I want to bring charges against your 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 Sheka, your Marshida. And their Kadi should say, okay, we're gonna hear your case. And I could be wrong, right? Maybe the charges are dropped or whatever. We had the same situation where the people in the cult that are like pretty much pleading to the people that are supposed to administer justice um in their cult, and they won't even hear them, right? They won't even have the case. Why? Because the leaders, the leader is in charge and they cannot bring any charges or any negative negativity to the leader. Um, oh yeah, claymation, not animation, claymation. <laughs> um, so to be adaptable, um, Allah, Allah says, Allah grants wisdom to whoever he wills, and whoever is granted wisdom is certainly blessed with a great pr privilege. But none will be mindful of this except people of reason. So wisdom uh, um, relates to being able to adapt to situations, right? Look at Rasul Sallallahu Look at the Mecca stage versus the Medina stage. In Mecca, you had Muslims that were getting tortured, abused, right? Being being um, martyred. And what, what was Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi telling them? He was telling them, be patient, be patient, be patient, be patient. In Medina, it's a different situation. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi adapted. Because that when they got to Medina, Allah gave them the permission to defend themselves, to fight back. Now it's a different conversation. Now we're supposed to start something saying, come follow me, follow me to battle, right? He's not saying, oh, be patient, be patient, be patient, right? Don't do anything back. Don't defend yourselves. Okay, so you're, you've got to be able to adapt to change and also be able to adapt again and this is the, the, this comes up a lot being able to adapt to who you're specifically leading to who you're giving instructions to some people you might need to give clear very clear detailed to the point instructions go do xyz other people they might be in a situation where you have to like coach them you have to explain why they're doing it explain the the logic behind it give the sources, the evidence, and all these different things. And that's a part of coaching them to help get the person better. So a good Islamic leader knows how to adapt to the situation and knows how to adapt to different people that they're dealing with. How many doors do I got? Ah, there we go. This is the last one. Okay, alhamdulillah. We're, we're going to be ending on time, inshallah. Um, just before I close out, if there's any questions or anything about the topics, just go ahead and type them into the chats. Um, just so you know, to actually um, speak on the cult discussions, you have to enter in the link that I posted. Um, but we'll get better at put, putting that stuff out and giving people better instructions when we get there. So the last um, quality um, that was mentioned is good Islamic leaders don't seek revenge. They don't seek revenge. They don't. Um, and you'll see that cult leaders always seek revenge. Always, 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 always. When we have the hadith from Aisha, anha, and Aisha, you know, Aisha is the wife of Rasulullah. Okay, she's the wife of Rasulullah, and she knows him very well. She knows like his inner thing. She knows, like, you know, for instance, put this in the context of us, of spouses. You know, even though we might not publicly act a certain way, our spouses know the real us. You know, so and so is acting real pious when he's with a lot of people. When he comes in the house, he's cursing, he's backbiting, he's talking a lot of trash. Where Aisha is, you know, seeing both sides of Rasulullah, how he acts in private, and how he acts in public. And we know, we already know there's no difference, right? So she said, whenever Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
was given the choice of one of two matters, he would choose the easier of the two. Okay? As long as it was not sinful to do so. But if it was sinful to do so, he would not approach it. And here's the important part. Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, never, never, never took revenge over anybody for his own sake. He never took revenge for his own sake. Never took revenge for his own sake. But he did only when Allah's legal bindings were outraged, in which case he would take revenge for Allah's sake. So the only time that he went after people or had an issue with people is when they violated the commandments of Allah. When they violated the Quran and the Sunnah. When someone personally violated, he never took revenge. Never in his life took revenge. Okay? And it's very interesting when you think about this because when you're violating Rasulullah you're violating the messenger of Allah. You're violating the messenger of Allah. So like someone could even make the case that even a violation or a disrespect or whatever to Rasulullah right, is actually violating the commandments of Allah. But just think about that. Rasulullah who's directly connected to Islam. We cannot be Muslim without acknowledging and recognizing the status of Rasulullah We say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah And that's the only way we can be Muslim. We cannot become Muslim if we say, La ilaha illallah. If we just say that and don't say, Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we do not become Muslim. Even the Meccan pagan said, La ilaha illallah. Yeah, there's no God but Allah. Right? They even, even they had that position. So we, uh, well, they didn't have that position, but they had the position that Allah was the supreme God. Right? So just think about that. Rasulullah never took personal revenge. And you see these cult leaders, anytime someone does anything that they don't like, they immediately try to punish that person, exact revenge, put that person in their place over and over and over and over. Okay? So that's what happens. That's what happens. Cult leaders will take revenge. And it could be stuff that doesn't even need to be revenge. Like, for instance, why would a cult leader kick people out of their cult just for posting statuses? just for liking other people's statuses, just for having a comment that they don't like, right? That's a sure sign of a cult leader. Let's see. Uh, Muhammad the Gambian says, uh, let's see. Surah al Furqan, verse 52. Allah says, so do not follow the unbelievers and fight against them a mighty striving with it. This is a Mecki ayat, Mecki ayat. Okay. So do not follow them leaders and fight against them. Uh, mighty strength. Oh, so you're trying to say it there. I'm pretty sure that they weren't given the permission to fight until Medina, but you know, you know better than me. Um, but we know that they actually didn't fight until Medina, the Battle of Badr. Um, but that's the point. Either way, is there was two different situations, and Rasulullah showed how he was adaptable to those different situations. Um, and another, you know, speaking about fighting, even being adaptable in the different types of battles that Rasulullah and the Sahabas encountered. So you have the, the Battle of Badr, where there's extreme success, right? They were outnumbered, out, out, they were outmanned, they were out, they had less weapons, they had less horses, they had less er everything. But they won. Then you have the Battle of Uhud where they lost. You know, so being able to deal with those situations um, and being able to adapt to those situations is very important quality of a Muslim leader. So um, if there's any questions, I'll wait a few seconds for the lag to catch up. And there's not any questions that we'll close out while I talk about the, um, the last thing. So next week. We are not going to talk about the relationships between that's all we are going to talk about. Um, Islamic leaders, bad, bad leaders, and cult leaders. Because I think it's important to address that. Because when you're talking about cult leaders, it's not. Is there's there's a lot of gray areas, 
okay? It's, these things aren't black and white. It's not like you're going to see one bad leadership quality and be like, oh, that's a cult leader, right? Or you're going to see one leader like do something that's outside of the character of the leadership of resources. So someone's like, oh, that person's a bad leader. That person's a cult leader, right? There's gray areas. And we're going to talk about how to like differentiate and identify what what makes a person a good leader or a good Islamic leader versus someone who's just a bad leader and versus someone who is clearly a cult leader. Uh, let's see. Got another comment by Muhammad the Gambian. Only if those hiding the facts would be honest instead of lying. They don't want Sira, but Hadith. They want Quran, but Tafsir of their own, all to keep us away from the true message of Islam. Okay. All right. So if there's anything else, any other questions, otherwise you can message me privately. I hope everybody's Ramadan is going good. Um, in a few days, we're going to be doing um, another show on the last 10 days, regarding the last 10 days of Ramadan and Layat al Qadr, um, signs to look for it and these sorts of things. And during the last 10 days, um, before Ramadan ends, inshallah, we'll be doing a closing out of Ramadan show which, you know, we'll talk about a few topics. One of the topics maybe be about etiquettes of the Eid. And then, you know, we'll go from there. So, inshallah, if there's any questions, concerns, please message me privately. privately. Ramadan Mubarak, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi.